Luke 2, chapter 1. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration which Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to Judah, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the end. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen and has been told to them. Father, thank you so much for this, the wonderful story that we know so familiar, but may you protect us from the familiarity to lose the all of what occurred and the impact it continues to have from that night forward. And so we praise you and thank you for Christmas. We thank you for uh, the Lord Jesus, the babe in the manger who didn't stay there. And, and so, Father, as we look into this familiar story, let us learn things or be a, reaffirm things that would encourage us and help us in our walk with him. And we thank you in his name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, we just read the familiar Christmas story, and you likely have either read it already in your homes uh, or individually, or you will do that. Uh, There will probably be sitting around your living room, uh, maybe a Christmas Eve, uh, but you will read this story and share the truths with Uh, your family, and just be uh, once again contemplative of the great story of Christmas. Now, as you look at the Christmas story, there's multiple characters which may uh, view the birth, we may view the birth of our Lord. Uh, The two prominent ones, obviously, are Mary and the shepherds. Uh, They provide wonderful insights even in living the Christian life. For instance, Mary, and Lord willing, we'll look at Mary uh, next week, next Sunday night, but look at Mary, you see what we read there in verse 19, but Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. So you see in Mary the example of the contemplative life, of the meditative life, which we all face uh, the daunting task of meditating upon the truths of God. There are so many loud screams in the world and in our own lives uh, that prevent us from those setting aside times of meditation upon the attributes of God, the person of our God. But Mary uh, shows us that this is the way of the Christian life, to treasure up these things, to ponder these things, and ponder them deep within the very being of her person, of her heart. Well, tonight we want to take a um, uh, a look at these shepherds, the other uh, way that we can look the Christmas story and see some help from them in our walk with the Lord Jesus. I've been thinking about shepherds more recently, uh, part of it because uh, of the overwhelming uh, task of being a shepherd to God's people, uh, the feeling of inadequacy that comes up on every true shepherd uh, that God places in the flock to care for his people. But also I've been thinking about shepherds as I put up the manger scene in my yard 
uh, that manger scene takes on a special uh, meaning this year because that manger scene was, uh, was constructed by my dad. Uh, pardon the personal illustration here, but he built that thing many, many, many years ago, and it shows the wear and tear. Uh, those sheep probably should have been put out to pasture a long time ago. Uh, but nevertheless, um, it's special because the man that made them is living with me. And so I actually put them up and uh, put some snowman out on the, on the yard that my mom, my dad made, and my mom painted. And, uh, and I said, Dad, I said, uh, he watched me put them in the yard. And uh, I said, Dad, let's go outside. I want to show you some things. And so I took him out in the front yard, and he, we looked around and reminisced uh, just through that. So shepherds have taken on a different, uh, um, uh, a, a different feel for me this morning. I should say this season as I, as I did that. But it took on also a sense of envy is I look at these shepherds, and there is a spirit of envy. Because what the shepherds have is something that I need to guard for, and you do too, is they were overwhelmed with awe. They were overwhelmed with amazement over what was transcribing before their very eyes. And if anything tonight, get that, is may God help us not to just go through the rigors or the routines of Christmas in a mindless way and lose the shepherd all that comes from the story. There's a recent book. I'm going to plug a book in for you. It's very small. It would be a great devotional for you. It's called Christmas Thoughts by J.C. Ryle. Banner Truth just put it out this month. And, uh, and, and Ryle said this. He wrote, there's like four, four sermons in here about Christmas reflections. And Ryle said this. Uh, Christmas is a season which almost all Christians observe in one way or another. Some keep it as a religious season. Some keep it as a holiday. But all over the world, wherever there are Christians, in one way or another, Christmas is kept. He would go on to say, but reader, how many of those who keep Christmas ever consider why Christmas is kept? How many in their Christmas plans and arrangements give a thought to him without whom there would have been no Christmas at all? How many ever remember that the Lord Jesus Christ is the cause of Christmas? How many ever reflect that the first intention of Christmas was to remind Christians of Christ's birth and coming into the world? Reader, how is it with you? What do you think of at Christmas? And if I was to ask that question, every one of you say, I think of the Lord Jesus. But then I would ask you the following question. Do you think upon him with a sense of awe? With a sense of shepherd-like awe? Well, what I want to do tonight is just offer to you some five qualities that will apply in the Christian life from the shepherds. And from this Luke chapter 2 passage, we'll work our way through that and identify these five uh, really foundational qualities in living the Christian life. But first, let's take a brief survey of history in the Bi- of shepherds in the Bible. Well, right out of the gate in Genesis chapter 4, verse 2, we find that shepherding was the oldest occupation there was is that Abel himself, uh, she was a, he was a shepherd. It says in Genesis 4, 2, and again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain a worker of the ground. So we see that God initially, right out of the gate of creation, is that he has a heart towards shepherds. The first occupation was that of a shepherd. But it also came to be a despised occupation, a despised occupation. Uh, the Egyptians... They had nothing but, but, but uh, abominable thoughts towards shepherding. In Genesis chapter 46, verse 34, uh, we read, You shall say, Your servants have been keepers of livestock from our youth, even until now, both we and our fathers, in order that you may dwell in the land of Goshen. This was when Joseph is bringing his family to Egypt, and this is what he instructs them to tell Pharaoh. And he says here, You may dwell in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. That actually has some prophetic overturns to it. It's because was not the great shepherd himself despised of men? And so we see then that the shepherding occupation is as old as time. It also was a despised occupation. But God loves shepherds. God loves shepherds. He has a deep heart, certainly for all of humanity, but he also has a special heart towards shepherds. Think about the godly heritage found in shepherds. Abraham... Jacob, Moses, David. And what about God's leaders, the pastors in his church? 
Peter would tell us in 1 Peter 5, 1 and 2. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Care for them. I want you to look at Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. And I want you to, 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 to listen as I read this. It's lengthy, but it's, it's, it's so encouraging because it shows, it shows God's heart towards the men that he puts in the shepherding of his flock. It's in Paul's uh, speaking to the Ephesian elders. And as I read this, I want you to see Paul, a shepherd, and his affection for the sheep, and his affection for other shepherds. Now from Miletus, verse 17, chapter 20, now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders, the shepherds of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials. And by the way, those are qualifiers of shepherds. Humility, tears, and trials. He says, that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await for me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself. Those are further qualifiers of the shepherds that God gives to his church. Not only humility, tears, and trials, but also this, this sense of not counting my life of any value or precious to myself, that I may finish my course and ministry that I've received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that none of you among whom I've gone about proclaiming the kingdom of God will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock. Do you see the order that God places upon his shepherds in his, uh, in his flock? The shepherds, you take care of your own heart. You take care of your own life before you uh, uh, even consider taking care of the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own cells will arise men speaking twisted things to draw among the disciples after them. Just a comment on that. This happens so often. A wise pastor once told me sometime before I was in pastoral ministry, he knew I was going to. He looked at me and he said to me, he said, listen, Jim, he says, you are going to incur sheep bites. He says, you're going to incur sheep bites. He says, your responsibility is to make sure they don't get infected. And they don't get infected with the spirit of bitterness, with the spirit of criticalness, and the spirit of unlovingness towards the sheep. He says, sheep bites are an occupational hazard. And so he goes on, and Paul would say here, I know that after my departure, okay, therefore be alert, remembering for three years, I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend to you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands minister to my necessities and to those who are with me. In all these things, I've shown you that by working hard, another quality of a shepherd, in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And now see the affection of the, of the shepherd Paul. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. So I read that lengthy thing because we get an insight of how God sees his shepherds. And that, and that shepherding God's flock is hard. Much tears, much trials, sheep bites even. And so... But God places this upon those of, of, of his choice men, or not, not choice men, but called men. And we find Solomon also saying about leaders in the church, they know well, the, he, he says, know well the condition of your flock. That means shepherds have to be immersed in body life. They got to be able to understand the condition of their flocks. He would also say, be, then dilig be diligent to know the state of, of the flock. So by way of building up to these five qualities in the Christmas shepherds that help us as Christians 
we have seen number one is that the, the shepherding occupation is, is the oldest one. Number two, God loves shepherds. Uh, God's leaders are shepherds. Number three, God's son is the ultimate shepherd, is the ultimate shepherd. We know in John chapter 10, verse 14, we find Jesus saying, I am the good shepherd. That's an interesting uh, word there, good. It is the word kalos, and it means more than just good opposed to bad. The word actually has a translation of beautiful, of beautiful. A Greek scholar named E.V. Rye translates the first part of that wonderful verse where Jesus, I am the good shepherd. He, he translates it, I am the shepherd, the shepherd beautiful. And isn't that a wonderful picture of who Jesus really is? Is that he's the one that nurtures his sheep. And he's the one that nurtures and, and instructs his shepherds. Now this, old te- this, this imagery of God, the Lord Jesus being our shepherd, it's not missed in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, we have the imagery of God as the shepherd of Israel in many places. Isaiah 40, perhaps, is the most warming Behold, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those that are with young. And so, as we read, uh, as we read earlier, the message of our Savior's birth that night... And the Christmas shepherds were the recipients of that. I want us to now work through Luke chapter 2. And just, qua- just for the next few minutes here, just outline for us some uh, principles for Christian living by observing what the shepherds did uh, that fateful night. And the first one, look at verse 15. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another... Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. Now, don't miss the childlike simplicity of their faith. Christmas shepherds exercise childlike faith. The angel says, suddenly there was with the angel, and they said that that this this babe, tonight there's born a a savior in the city of David. Now, if you look at verse 15, the shepherds don't say, let's go see if it really did happen. The shepherds are not skeptic about this. The shepherds basically said, look, let's go over and see this thing that has happened. They accepted with childlike faith, you know, the truth of what was told them concerning the Lord Jesus. And is that not a powerful lesson for us? Is to simply accept that with childlike faith what God has said in his word and what he has promised to us. Now, I realize it's hard in times of dark providence and there's much pain. But the excitement of the moment did not fade. The ramped up excitement did not fade. Is that they exercised faith that led to obedience. They exercised faith. And that is always the first sure sign of genuine faith. It is found in belief in his word that produced an action of obedience. And that leads to verse 16. The Christmas shepherds didn't delay obeying the word. Not only did they exercise faith... Let's go see what has already happened. And they had no idea. All they had was an angelic messenger burst on the scene in this night, this, this, this Egyptian darkness, except for the stars. And they, they see and they hear this message. And they didn't sit there and just ration it out every time among themselves. They didn't say, nah, did you really see that? Did, did that really happen? No, surely that wasn't. No, that, this guy didn't really do that. They didn't ration. No, they, they immediately accepted it with childlike faith. And they went, which, and that says in verse 16, and they went with haste. I find in my own life that most of the time, haste is not good. <laughs> and if you're impulsive and you're hasty, that rarely works for good. Uh, I think all of you would shake your head yes. Have you ever impulsively made an emotional decision or stepped out in something that was emotional and you look back and say, I wish I would have waited? Not these guys. This is a good haste. This is a good stepping out in haste because what they did was they, they, they responded to the message. The message said, you will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. So they told them, the Savior's been born, and by the way, this is where he's going to be, and this is what you're going to find. So they had all kinds of evidence, so to speak, by which they had every right to be hasty. Because it wasn't hasty from an internal motivation. 
It was a haste because of the excitement of what had already happened that they were going to verify. They went with anticipation, and they went in a hurry. I sometimes wonder when it comes to us, I'll, I'll lead the pack on that, is that we take three options in the Christian life when it comes to obeying the Word of God. We either immediately obey it, despite our circumstances and our feelings, or we disobey it because of our circumstances and feelings, or we say this, I'll, I'll think about it. There's no such thing as delayed obedience. Delayed obedience is simple disobedience. The, seven, the shepherds set the model of haste in a very good way. It was a haste to exercise obedient faith. So what do we take away from them and these two qualities in the Christian life? Exercise faith on the trustworthiness of God's word is that he has said in Psalm 138, verse 2, I have, I have exalted above all things my name and my word. God stakes his character on his person and his word. And he is true to himself. He is true to his promises. He is true to everything. Even when the blanket of dark, conf, dark providence lays upon you and you can't see the light of his countenance, you can trust the light of his word is you can trust the light of his word in the midst of that, to burn through the fog, that he will do that. And so the shepherds show us a tremendous childlike faith. And, and let's don't remain childlike in understanding, but childlike in faith, and simply fall at his feet and believe what he has said. And then take that and put it into action. Because they would have never validated their faith that they just would have sat there out there with the sheep and said, okay, thanks for the good news, maybe tomorrow. Maybe we'll go check it out tomorrow. No, the message was so powerful. And it was so hopeful. And it was so full of illumination in a dark world. They could not wait to obey. They could not wait to go. They were told to go. And they said, we'll go. So that's the second lesson of Christmas shepherds, which we can learn in our own Christian life. Let's exercise faith by first believing what has been told and then to validate that true belief by don't delay obedience to what we've been told. The third thing, look at verse 17 and 18. Christmas shepherds are bold to talk about Christ. They're bold to talk about Christ. And when they saw it, what did they see? Well, they saw what we uh, read in verse 16. They found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. Can you imagine what that would have been like? These shepherds, these despised occupation, they, they, they're awakened in the night by this tremendous display of glory. They hear this, the news, the good news of, of all good news, and then they go, and it's just exactly like the, the messenger told him or told them exactly that you are going to find, you are going to find this baby lying in a manger. And in verse 17, Chris, and when they saw it, when they saw it, what was told, what did they do with it? They couldn't keep it in. They couldn't keep it in. And when they saw it, they'd made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. Christmas shepherds were bold to talk about Jesus. They simply could not keep the good news to themselves. And I think that begs the question for us. And it begs the question for me. Has the staggering truth that I am no longer under the wrath of God has the staggering truth that I've been delivered from a condemnation that I richly deserve, never again to be up upon my neck, never being under the bondage and the yoke of my sin that's forever removed, does it prompt me to see all around me, in my neighborhood, those who are still blinded and still under the yoke of God's wrath? The shepherds were so... What, what strikes me about these guys, they so forgot themselves... My biggest problem in my life is me. Is I, and it's your problem too. Your biggest problem in your Christian life is me because life begins to revolve around me. And when it starts to revolve around me, you know what happens? You're oblivious 
to what's around you. You're oblivious to the hurt around you. You're oblivious to those that are outside of Christ that are one breath away from eternity of condemnation. You're oblivious that there's people in our church that are going to go through a Christmas, the very first one, alone. We're oblivious to the hurt around us because oftentimes we are so wrapped up in our own little worlds that we lost the wonder of the gospel and the wonder of Christmas to where Christmas becomes all about me, my, and mine and not about him and them. And Christmas is not about me, my, and mine. Christmas is about him and them. And the shepherds come and what do they do? They saw it. And they didn't just hunker down in their own little fellowship group and say, wow, wow, we saw it. It says here, they made known the saying. Well, where'd they make known? I get they made known wherever they went. Whoever was with an earshot got an earful. I said this before, it was said of George Whitfield, you could be with him for 30 minutes and he would ask about your soul. You could be with him for 30 minutes and he'd ask you about the state of your soul. And notice the response in verse 18 of this message. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. Some of them may have said, these guys are nuts. These guys are crazy. A baby in a manger? God in a manger? But one thing we also would say, says, and all who heard it wondered, it may have been the skeptics who just immediately, dis, uh, immediately dismissed it, but I'm venturing to say that there were those who say, maybe I need to see too. Maybe I need to see too. Never underestimate the power of sharing the word of God as you go in life and the impact it's going to have on someone. It may not be that day. It may not be next week. It might be 10 years. You don't know, but I do know because of the Christmas shepherds that we can exercise faith in the belief of his word that causes us to go into the world and say, hey, listen, Christmas is not about, you know, that sale on whatever Friday it is. Is that Christmas is all about the fact that God so loved the world that he invaded our world so that you and I could be removed from the wrath of God. And I think it's time for us to awaken out of ourselves and get like these shepherds and forget ourselves and let's start being what we're supposed to be to a world that needs to see the fact that the Savior has come. Saving faith will always produce proclaiming faith. Saving faith will always produce proclaiming faith. You simply cannot encounter Jesus Christ and not be a proclaimer of his name. And now, I, I, I'm, I don't want to be, you know, it's not a beat down sermon. We don't beat people down here. But the reality is some people say, well, I'm an introvert. I, I can't speak for Christ. Can you quote John 3.16? Can you look at a neighbor and say, hey, listen, It's Christmas. Did you know that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son? Do you know that this is why Christmas exists? We got to be so careful that we don't allow fear to paralyze us at Christmas. And we also got to be, uh, we got to be careful that we don't assume people don't want to talk about spiritual things because that's not true. People are looking for substance. People are looking for uh, looking for, in a world that has nothing to offer them, and they're coming at the end of themselves, and they see the pandemic opened up a lot of things, and now we're in a world that's hopelessness that is spiraling down in more and more under the wrath of God, and people are, are crying out, is there any hope? Remember the, um, the story about the, the, the submarine? That had, um, uh, that had sunk, and uh, there was still oxygen there, and they tried a rescue mission. It was a long time ago. They tried a rescue mission, and they went down, and they heard the tapping on the hall, Morse code, and they translated it to divers on a rescue mission, and from inside the sub, it, it translated, is there any hope? And there wasn't. They couldn't salvage the, the crew. But for us, we can look at our neighbors who are suffering hopelessness. We can say, uh, there is hope. And the shepherds, what do they do? They exercise childlike faith. Secondly, it was validated because they went and obeyed what the angels told them to do. The third thing, because it was true and because of just the imp implications in them as well as humanity, uh, they were bold to talk about Jesus. 
I admit we struggle with fear at times when it comes to witnessing. I, I admit that we struggle sometimes. Do you know how you overcome fear of witnessing? Be overcome with the awe of who Christ is. Is be overcome your fear of man by the fear of, uh, of God. Which couched in the fear of God is the love of God. John Bunyan said that we fear man so much because we fear God so little. And so when you look at what these Christmas shepherds did, what an amazing, what an amazing example of how to live the Christian life. Accepting the childlike faith, what was told, just like we're told in the pages of this book. Validate that faith by doing what the book says. And thirdly, when we see the reality that God opens up our mind and our hearts and illuminates us um, to the person of Jesus Christ and the wonder of salvation, um, we become bold to talk for Christ. Now, one of the qualifiers that we would talk about Christ on a consistent basis, and it's something that I, I know that, uh, you know, Glenn and I talked about this. It's something that is a burden on my heart. You gotta love people. You have to love people. And you can't look at people any other than this. There are only two types of people in the world. Every one of us are image bearers. Every single human being is an image bearer. They deserve dignity. Every single human being, even the ones that rubs us wrong, or ones that that maybe she bites, every single human being deserves dignity because they're image bearers. But that's where it breaks down into two categories. You got image bearers, and then you got two categories. You got the image bearers who now are able to reflect the image of God because of the gospel. And then you have the image bearers who need the gospel so they can reflect the glory of God. And so what a wonderful thing it would be if we as Christians could simplify our view of humanity and love humanity, number one, because everyone's an image bearer that deserves dignity, and number two is that we see every single human being either in Christ, needing encouraged by the gospel, or they're outside of Christ and they need the gospel. So the shepherds then were bold to talk about Christ. Number four, look at verse 20. Verse 20. We see in verse 15, they exercised faith. We see in verse 16, they didn't delay obeying the word. We see in verse 17 and 18, they were bold to talk about Christ. And we see in verse 20, they remembered their responsibilities. They remembered their responsibilities. And the shepherds returned. Where'd they go? Hey, remember, they got a bunch of sheep out there in the field. Nobody's watching them. They're on their own. And we know what sheep are prone to do because we are. They're prone to wonder. Every one of us feel the pull to wonder. Well, those sheep out there need their shepherds. And so what does it do? It says, the shepherds returned. They returned. Right back to their sheep. I think this is an amazing quality in them. It would be so easy to get wrapped up in the excitement and get wrapped up in all that's happening. And now the good news of a Savior gets so enamored by all that, they could have, said, well, they could have just forgot. But they didn't. They went back. And what's the lesson for us? Salvation does not make us so heavenly minded. We are of no earthly good. I had a guy on a ship. A guy worked for me. He was a young Christian. Um, and he was a Christian. And he was, uh, he, was, he was a young sailor, 21, um, he was, um, but he was a Christian, and he was very zealous as a Christian. And one of my biggest problems I had with him is that he would waste government time on things of God when he should have been given the government their due time. He was not one of my best workers. As a Christian, he should have been the best. And so he took the time that he should have been honoring his, the United States Navy and the chain of command. He should have done his best for there as a testimony instead of being so falsely, uh, falsely full of piety, false piety, that he was just sharing the God. And nothing wrong with sharing the gospel. And I had to take him aside and I had to say, listen, I got it. I'm burdened for these, our shipmates too. But we have responsibilities in the world. And one of your responsibilities is not to use the time when you're supposed to be swabbing the deck and standing watch 
that you're sharing and reading your Bible. Well, the shepherds weren't, didn't neglect their responsibilities. Friends, one of the most important things we do in our testimony for Jesus Christ is we don't neglect our responsibilities. Is that we maintain our responsibility domestically, you know, vocationally, and the shepherds modeled that for us. C.S. Lewis said, a continual looking forward to the eternal world is not a form of escapism or wishful thinking, but one of the things a Christian is meant to do. It does not mean that we are to lead the present world as it is. If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next world. End quote. All right, so let's, here's the last point. Number five. In verse 20. And the shepherds returned. They didn't neglect their responsibilities. And they returned what? Not boasting of their experience. Not focusing on the privilege, uh, privilege they had to be the receivers of the message. They were totally void of themselves. And I know that might be hyperbole in saying that. But the fact is you don't have these guys focusing on themselves. They obeyed the word of God. They went and told people what they saw. All they shared was what they were told. They didn't neglect their responsibilities. And at the end, the Christmas shepherd centered on the giver of the gift, not just the gift. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. There is nothing in that statement that is self-serving. It was, if it was anything, it was just self-denying as messengers of what they heard. Glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. They didn't embellish. They simply told what was told to them. And they focused on the giver of the gift, not just the gift. French Christmas is not an event or a holiday. It's a celebration centered on the living God. In fact, a very appropriate capturing of the whole of the Christmas message is in a verse that you may not consider a Christmas verse, but may very well be the most, the most vivid and the most important Christmas verse ever. John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Christmas is about giving. Christmas is about denying self and giving. And God gave the greatest and most indescribable gift possible. A son. A son who is the savior for sinners. And like the shepherds, the only proper response is self-emptying worship. Glory and praise for a wonderful God. I mentioned earlier that my biggest problem in my Christian life is me. It's so true. And the greatest liberation for me I can have is to get my eyes on him who came and who lived the life, the humble life from cradle to cross and focusing on him. And I can do that by focusing on the lessons from the shepherds. Shepherds who exercised faith. Shepherds who did not delay obeying the word. Shepherds who were bold to talk about Jesus. Shepherds who remembered the responsibilities. And shepherds who centered more on the giver of the gift than the gift itself. And even being a receiver of the gift. There was a store manager that was discussing Christmas with a pastor. And the store manager said, when Christmas is over, it's over. And it's my job to rid this store completely of Christmas in one day. The pastor pondered for a moment and replied, Well, sir, my job is to keep Christmas in the hearts of my people for a lifetime. Those shepherds will never be the same. And encountering the Christ of Christmas, we should never be the same either. But always remember, Christ's birth leads to Christ's death. And when he died, we died with him. And when he rose, we rose with him, that we might walk in newness of life. And may the shepherds, may the shepherds give us some practical principles on how to live that newness of life. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful that uh, you preserved your word and 
What a glorious time it would have been to, to be there in those fields when the, when the night exploded and the angelic host come and say, Behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city, you know, in, in the city a Savior, which is Christ the Lord, and they went with haste. Father, may we be those type of people. If need be, would you recapture the all of Christmas? And would you help us to look at these simple shepherds, despised by men, cherished by you, and may we learn from them the simplicity of living the Christian life in the all of the Christ who came and who lived and who died and who rose and who's preparing a place and is coming back for us. Help us to keep Christmas what it truly is, the all that the world has received her God. And Father, we honor you and praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.